Back in the day, if you didn't run one of my engines, you didn't win. My mind says I can do all this stuff, but my body says you, you can't. But, but those are some of the things we had to do to make the engine live. This is Ed Pink's personal garage. The Ed Pink. Not the race shop. This is his garage. This is pretty much the truth, too. <laughs> you can sit here and just look at pictures all day because there's literally history hanging on the walls incredible yeah i wasn't expecting this it's very similar that your uh interior decorating taste is same. the same yeah <laughs> <laughs> well the biggest thing i got going on is you guys here today so we can talk about the 427 single head cam port engine so you were the first guy to really start using that engine in drag racing what about what year was that 1966 I, I wasn't the first okay uh, Connie Coletta was the first all right and uh, Pete Robinson was one of the first but the biggest reason that Ford was excited about having me they were looking for somebody that was in the engine business that could build these engines and sell them to other people and that was a big thing I had going with Ford the thing is this the engine was originally designed and built for NASCAR but I have a feeling somebody didn't read the rule book close enough because the rule book for NASCAR said no brake cams. They here they had this engine and they didn't know what to do with it. And then they decided, well, let's give it to drag racing. And that's how it came to drag racing. But the thing that Ford saw is they weren't getting it in other people's cars. Lou Bainey came around and wanted to run a Ford engine in his dragster. And we went back to Ford uh, Ford was very excited about it because number one, they got Lou Bainey Ford Agency going to be running the engine. Ed Pink Engine Builder is going to be building the engine, so there's a good chance that he'll be able to sell the engine to other people. And that's what excited Ford. Because you were already doing engines for Lou at the no, time. We were doing 392 Chrysler's for him. 392 Chrysler's, yeah. okay. Yes. And then the 426 Chrysler came along and the camera came along. Only downside to the camera is that it was a very labor-intensive engine to work on. And, you know, these guys are pulling the engines apart between rounds, and with that would be really hard to do because of oh. the chain and setting the cams. Where on a 392 Chrysler, you can take the heads off, take the pistons out, put new pistons in, heads and all that, and you, you don't adjust, you don't touch the cam. I'll see you Still working. Well, I help people. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Ed is the quarterback of this whole video, and he thought to better understand the 427 single overhead cam Ford that we needed to know some of the backstory on the Chrysler and the Hemis to understand the importance of the camera. When drag racing first started, the Chrysler Hemi was the engine they were running. They, they Already, were, okay. Yeah, there are a few guys who run small block Chevys mm -hmm. with superchargers. And there was a couple guys that ran big block Chevys. When the 426 came out, it took a little work to get it really to be better than the 392. It should have been better than the 392 to start with because it started out at 426 inches. But there were some things about it that were come different than the 392. And one of the things was the shoulder head. The 392 had a small combustion chamber. The 426 had a huge combustion chamber. So consequently, one of the major things that, that we came across was the fact that uh, the amount of spark lead that you run with a 392 versus a 426 were night and day. 392, if I'm not mistaken, the cc's in the combustion chamber of the head was like 100. Mm -hmm. And on the 426, it was 175. A lot more. So, yeah. So consequently... The spark plug from the piston is a long ways away. It ended up the 426 took a lot more spark weight. Some guys, like Garlitz, what he did is he just started cranking spark lead in it until it quit running good. With me being in the engine business, I had to take more of a scientific approach to it rather than just throw a spark lead at it because I'm dealing with customers that they're paying for their stuff. They want to have somebody doing things that knows what they're doing rather than just close their eyes and going for it. 
he ended up with the 426 running 75 degree spark leak. 75 degrees? Yeah. <laughs> this is barely halfway. <laughs> <laughs> but that, That's what you had to have because yeah. of the, the size. Back and... in the day, if you didn't run one of my engines, you didn't win. And a lot of times you didn't qualify. Thing was, you had a John Butera car and an Ed Pink engine, and you were killer. That might be the opening line of this video. If you didn't have one of my engines, you didn't win. <laughs> that, that was, a, that was yeah. we went on for about, we had that about two years. You go to a, a big drag meet, and there'd be like uh, 16, say 16, 20 cars, and 10 or 12 of them would be a Butera car and an Ed Pink engine. When you heard one of ours fire up, you knew right away whose it was. Because I kept the sparkly thing pretty quiet. I and bet you did. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. That much more CCs, the piston guys, that had to been just like a nightmare them, for them to fit me. That'd be just a massive dome. And but remember, also we were running low compression, so you know, in that day they were about six and a half, seven to one. Okay. Compression. All right. So that. All right. So it was almost a flat top piston. So making that move from Chrysler to Ford was actually a huge step for you. Yeah, a huge step. Luckily, I, I did have a little bit of 426 experience, not much. Most of it was all 392 experience. The, the 427 is a Hemi. Yeah, it is a Hemi. Okay. Yeah. So what happened the first time you tried to run this with Nitro? Well, the first time we tried to run it with Nitro, it, uh, it ran okay, and uh, the biggest thing that I noticed over the Chrysler engine is when we ran it, one side, complete side of the spark plugs looked like they hadn't done anything, and the other side were just about burned out. I tried all kinds of things to try to fix it. I tried uh, changing the fuel system. I tried changing the ignition system, and nothing, nothing would fix it. Nothing changed it. It was always the same. I got to looking at the chain thing. I had the front cover off the engine, had the chain all on it, and looking at it, and then turning the engine over, dawned on me that there's a chance that the chain is going through stretch because the fact when the engine was designed by Ford, it wasn't designed for a supercharger. I'm sure there are many times that the engine was 9,000 RPM by the time it get to the end of the quarter mile, especially on a good run. So it, it saw RPM that, that the engine didn't initially see. Uh, it saw the boost going into the combustion chamber that the engine never saw. The RPM was running and the blower and so forth. You're, you're running the valve springs that are probably 240, 250 pounds in the seat and 600, 700 pounds open. And that's all putting load on the chain. It, I got to the point where all the things that I had thought it might be, didn't phase it at all. And I decided that what was going on was the chain was going through stretch. Even though I had special chains made, chromoly chains, chromoly pins, and so forth, which helped it and made the chains last longer, but it did not correct the offset between the two of them. Then finally I decided that, that to fix it, I needed to make an offset between them and the big thing was how much offset that I want to put in to start with. But I realized that I needed to put more than what I thought it would take. I didn't, I didn't want to just mess around with a little bit because a little bit may show you nothing. And then all of a sudden you say, well, I'm not going that direction. So anyway, I decided that seven degrees was a good uh, spot to start. And uh, I put the drive cam, the drive side, at split overlap, and the trailing cam, I put it at seven degrees advance. Lo and behold, that fixed it. That, that simple change fixed it. And then from then on, it was just a matter of getting the, uh, once I figured out that and got that part correct, then it was just a matter of getting the rest of the tune-up on the engine right. And then from then on, it ran really good. In fact, it was the first engine to run in the sixes. It was at Bristol, Tennessee. And uh, 
with, the, with that cam split, uh, you could pull the spark plugs out of the engine and land there, and you couldn't tell what side they came from. Did it idle funny once you no. changed the no. other side? No. No. Because no. it would not be stretching at idle? No, if they stretch it idle, maybe it was a half a degree. Now, the engine uh, actually sounded more powerful. Yeah, no, it, uh, I mean, these things, uh, you know, when you're running 80%, 85% nitro with uh, probably 20 pounds of boost going into them, when they're sitting idling, they sound good. Yeah, I mean, you hit the throttle. I mean, they, they want to jump up off the ground. Once it leaves the starting line and, and you listen to it going down is when uh, you can tell the difference. Plus, one other thing, one of the first times we ran the engine, one of the, in, in the meets we ran, we ran a night race before I changed the cams. And you can see it as it's going down the racetrack, the side of the engine that didn't look like it was running had flame out the exhaust pipe this side and the other side real short. Huh. You that can see clue. the difference yeah. that adds. Yeah. yeah, that was another clue. If you've never seen a nitro car run at night, you you miss something in your life that should, you should do. When Ford did the block, they used the same block that they do in FE. And the only change they did is they didn't bore the lifter bore. They, 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 they were not bored out, so you didn't have a problem. There were some guys that uh, ran the camera engine and they used an FE block. And to do that, you got so many oil passages you got to plug. Ooh. You, you can't get oils in the lifters because there, there are no lifters. It's just open hole. Hmm. So you, you, yeah. So you got to plug all those. Uh, you got to plug some of the main oil galleys where it goes. No cam in there either, right? So there's, yeah, there's tons of leaks yeah. you would have to plug. Yeah. And if you get yeah. one of them wrong, yeah. everything dies yeah. quickly. <laughs> So what the camera has is uh, you got the crankshaft and the, and the gear on the front of the crank, and then there's a, uh, a stub shaft that's about that long that goes in number one and number two cam bearing. It has a main, main oil galley, runs a full length of the block, and then over each cam bearing, there's a hole drilled that goes down to the cam bearing. Then the hole goes this way, so it goes to the main bearing. Mm -hmm. So when you get to number four, you have to have a way to get the oil that's squirting in there to the uh, cylinder head, the rocker arms. And we t took a grooving tool and put a little groove from the main galley to it. it was about so that you can connect it. They'd be connected. Then we put the cam bearing in. Hmm. So that way it would seal it off. Behind the cam bearing. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'm explaining this right. Yeah. No, it's perfect. That yeah, makes total sense, yeah. yeah. But, but those are some of the things we had to do to make the engine live. So with that intermediate shaft about in there, what kept it from what kept it from moving back and forth? I was wondering that too. Did it have a retainer plate or something? Let me get it. We have the book. Yeah. <laughs> There's the six foot timing chain. Wow. Now that's the intermediate shaft. And that's the chain that goes around the intermediate mm -hmm. shaft. Like a normal timing chain. Yeah. 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 Where did this come from? Is this from Ford? From Ford. And what I did is I had a the actual catalog and then I made a copy of it so when it's out in the engine department and it gets grease on it or whatever, I'm not destroying the catalog. You know, what I thought of whenever you said someone didn't read the NASCAR rule book right is you always see these guys who are in the comments videos like, oh, the France family hates Ford. Oh, they're always against Ford. They let the Hemi run and then they banned the, the 427 because they hate Ford. Well, that's not, they may have hated him, I don't know about that. <laughs> but, you know, they, in the rule book it said no overhead cam. You can't argue with that. No, I, I, no. That's amazing right there. I mean, this, this is incredible history. There can't be that many of the originals of these things floating around anymore. These? Yeah. 
I'll, I'll show you the original. Well, you have it, of course you do. <laughs> yeah, he made copies of it. Well, I didn't know if he still he may have made those copies. This is B-roll for later, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your extra video is just page by page. Yeah. Turning through, oh my God, look at this thing. What? Yeah, there you go. And see, it's got Coletta running the camera. Who did they give these to? Uh, anybody was doing the engine. So this is, explains exactly what Billy was talking about on the camshaft, how because of the way that it rotates on this side, He's the intake, bit of gobbled, yeah. Because we're there was one of these engines out at Speedy Bill's museum, right? So if you yeah. haven't watched that video, yeah. yeah, you should go watch the video of us at Speedy Bill's museum in Nebraska. It's amazing. And we saw one of these engines sitting there and Billy was saying that the camshaft on one bank is different than the camshaft right. on the other bank. And the reason for that is the intake valve is on this side on that bank, so it's on the inside. Well, say it's on to the, we'll say it's to the right of the center line of the camshaft, and the exhaust is to the left of the center line of the camshaft. But on the other bank, it's flipped. The intake is on the left hand side of the center line, and the other is the right. And because of that direction of rotation, that same, that slack motion of rotation, the timing is the difference. So there's a left-hand cam right. and a right-hand cam. Yep. And then, as he discovered, <laughs> because of the length of the timing chain, you had to just set the offset of them. So yeah, it wasn't just like, okay, well, this four cylinders is the same as that four cylinders. And just, no, like not even close. Now you see why I suggested doing it the way we're doing it. Uh -huh. Because if you had come here putting the engine together, You'd have missed all the. You wouldn't have been. You'd have missed all this, the reason why stuff is done the way. We're now we're taking the complete engine and going through it how we got there and why. If you made it this far in the video, you would love all of the other history videos we've posted, including the other ones with Ed. Make sure you hit that subscribe button down there, so that way when we post a new video. When you open YouTube, it will recommend it to you. It doesn't cost anything. It's just basically like a follow button. And sometimes that's not even enough. So if you click a little bell too, it will give you a notification. We were, I knew we were gonna do this. And it's like, this is your last engine. And I talked to a couple of guys I knew that had built them. And they're like, oh yeah, this is like big time. These, these, are, these are not for the novice. And yeah. I'm like, I called you, I'm like, this is over my head. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not your guy to help you put this together. <laughs> get, get, get your upright guys and get it together. And then we can come talk about it <laughs> when it's done. Because <laughs> I don't want to be the person putting it together and having, messing up your last inch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, know, and, you know, the old saying, an engine's an engine. You know, but there's different idiosyncrasies that each engine has that you have to fall in line with to do. And this one has more than the average engine would have. Okay, right, here we go. So this thing says, it is capable of producing over 600 horsepower on gasoline. How much power are you making on nitro on one of these things? Uh, back in the day, I'd say probably 2,000, maybe 2,500. But you know what they're making Just now? four times more. They're making 11,000. Yeah, 11,000 horsepower. Yeah. But the, but it's it's completely gone from when I did it. It's night and day. It'd be cooler if they were still using factory made blocks and stuff for that. No. They, they, they would explode. They couldn't make one pass. No, yeah. we, we when we when we did them, uh, we used factory blocks because there wasn't any aluminum block made at the time, and we ran the Ford FE block, and it was good for about. As hard as we run them, it was good for about seven or eight passes down a quarter mile, and you throw the block away. When, when we... So that's right, one race weekend. Like, if you made it to eliminations, that was like qualifying you know, you, in eliminations, you, you that was about you, it. You could go through two two race weekends. Okay. That's about it. Yeah, maybe 10 runs, 11 runs, something like that. Okay. I know that when... Uh, when they when we won the winter national or the uh, spring nationals at bristol uh 
on the way there. On the way there. They stopped off at some drag strip and they had a weekend where they raced. So they ran four runs there. And plus, plus, plus probably two qualifying. So they ran six runs, four elimination runs and two qualifying runs. Then they come to Bristol and we made four qualifying runs and four elimination runs. So that's eight, 16 runs for the two races. And when they brought the car back and they brought me the engine, <laughs> the crankshaft was in the oil pan. It could not have made another run. <laughs> <laughs> that was the limit. <laughs> that, 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 of course, we ran it hard. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, you know, we ran it hard. That was the limit of the block at that point. Yeah, that was, yeah. I mean, we had to, as I remember, when we had to take the pan off, we had the floor jack underneath the pan. And once we got everything unbolted, we turned the floor jack and it came down and half the crankshaft was in the pan. <laughs> the ingenuity of like doing the most with what you had at the time, I think that makes the era so cool because, yeah. you know, that's like an incentive to have a favorite manufacturer, like picking Ford, Chevy, Chrysler, whoever. Like nowadays you don't have that. Like No. Because the block comes from somebody else. Like this thing here now, it's got aluminum block, aluminum cylinder heads, aftermarket. Now I don't know if this block is strong enough to, if, it, if you had a nitro engine, put a, a supercharger on it, it run nitro back in the day. Uh, I don't know if it's strong enough. For what we do on, ga on gasoline, it's plenty strong. But also one thing, that engine, that's an 800 pound engine. <laughs> that's a heavy engine. And that's some nose weight. <laughs> yeah. Had a hollow exhaust valve. Yeah, that's what they ran. Totally hollow or filled with something? I and they were know. sodium filled. We never ran them. Okay. Yeah, liquid sodium filled. It was World 1966. War. That's like Merlin stuff. I think they had uh, filled valves in those. So were those pistons back in the day, were they 2618 alloy pistons way back then? That's what we ran, yeah. Yeah. 2618. They so, were, there was two kinds of material available. I don't remember the other material, but it was one that uh, you, would use, you would do a street engine with it because it didn't grow much. You, you could run real tight clearance. Where with the 2618, you have to run more clearance because the piston grows so much. You see that thing? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what that is? That's a, is that the tensioner? No. What is that? There's the tensioner there. Oh, this is the tensioner's over here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, What's that thing? Fuel pump drive. The fuel pump bolts on here, and it's an eccentric. It goes, it doesn't go well. Oh, see, see. okay. Yeah, so you're right. The forces over here are completely yeah. different yeah. than over there because of that fuel pump eccentric. Yeah, yeah, because some of the guys that built these engines in later years, they they put the magneto up here, and you, that's a bad deal because that's the one that goes back. back right, yeah. You got you to run it off of here. Run the mag off the front yeah, of the yeah, of, yeah. because that's just, this is real timing that can lie it's, to you. It, yes. Yeah. Is this guy amazing? I don't know how you can remember all this. I, I'm amazing that I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't even born yet when this was going on, right? There were a lot of interesting comments on the the shop video of people that were impressed with your recollection and sharpness for your age. And one of the ones that I thought was the most funny is that it may be smelling nitromethane was a preventative measure to cure Alzheimer's or something. Could be. Plenty of nitro, plenty of methanol, you're good. All the, all the things they say are bad for you, even like around them forever. Well, he's so intelligent and he never stopped using his brain and working, so he's just, yeah. he keeps well, going. The thing, yeah, the thing is, is, I've got friends of mine that when they get to 65, 70, they retire and they sit and watch TV all day long. That's a good way to go dead, mm -hmm. brain dead.
I think people go brain dead doing that far younger than 65. Right. Look at most of the we people run people. running around. <laughs> well, I think you're just like you said, it's a, good, it's a good way to go dead, right? It's like when you stop engaging, yeah. just things go away quickly. Should we go over to the engine? And we can... yeah. yeah, tell us about it. Go, yeah, now, you, now we're like super hooked on this thing. This is incredible. Well, I figured that, you know, to come here and put the engine together, they're all the same. You know, they all get pistons and rods and stuff. It's all this stuff we're talking about that mm -hmm. people don't know about. Yeah, your stories. Yeah, well, your experience. Yeah, story. Let's put his stuff back so he doesn't have to do that. You said that's the last engine you're ever going to build? This is the last engine. It is. What are you going to do with it? I was going to Australia. Wow. It's just sold. That's kind of funny to think. So. One of your 427 Fords was the first ever to go into the sixes in an HRA competition. Right. And now your last engine you're ever building is a 427 that's going to go to Australia and go hot rod around the country. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, you know, when I sold the shop in 2008, I retired for, I don't know, about four months. <laughs> <laughs> sounds about right. About four months. And then I went back to work there because they wanted they wanted me to to stay. And then I got sick, and I had an intestine problem. I don't know whether I had told you that before or not. But no. anyway, I, I remember I, that I was sick, out of work for one year. I weighed when I got sick. I weighed 155, 160. I got down to 112 pounds. Wow. And I was very lucky. Uh, a good friend of mine, Bruce Meyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, is really tight at UCLA. And he got me into UCLA and got me into the right uh, uh, doctor and they found out what was going on. They didn't fix it, but they got it under control. But from the time it all happened, it was, I was out of work for a year. And then when I got back to where I was feeling good, I could go back to work, they, they didn't need me. And I thought, you know, I gotta do something. I had this shop and I, I used it as a, my hobby shop, fixing stuff for my wife at home and my roadster. And that was about it. And then I had people that I'd known throughout the industry and in various racing series I was involved in that were retired and wanted engines built. And I said to them, go to EPRE. They've got good people, same people, they'll do the engine. And they'd say, no, you don't understand. We want your DNA on it. We want an engine that you did, not your old shop. So I thought, well, you know, I love the engine business. I love the people I deal with. I thought, well, that's what I'll do. I'll, I'll do some engines. So I got, all of a sudden, there come one after another. I got six engines in here I'm doing. Four cameras and two flatheads. And then I did one for Ross Meyer. He found a, a 1936 Ford that I owned and raced in 1950. He restored it like it was the last time I ran it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he called me one day and said, you know, he said, I got the Ed Pink Ford. He says, the one thing I don't have is I need an Ed Pink engine for it. That was the start of all this. So I said, well, we need to get you an engine. So we built him a flathead for it. It was what I raced with in 1950 in that car. And uh, in fact, I took that car to Bonneville in 1949 for the first Bonneville meet on the salt. And uh, anyway, he bought the car and he found the car and he completely restored it. it it's amazing he could, that he was able to find it. So we did those two and then uh, this other fella an old customer of mine, he wanted a camera. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll build you a camera. And uh, and I, we just kind of got started all of a sudden, then somebody else wanted a camera. I ended up with four, and this was the last one. And you know, I gotta quit sometime, and I figured, well, what I'm gonna do is when the last camera's done, that's gonna be it. And I still help people, you know, but as far as building engines, I'm getting too old. 
Yeah. <laughs> they keep walking in the door bringing you parts. Yeah. Tell me what's wrong with this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing is this. My mind says I can do all this stuff, but my body says you you can't. Huh. Do you, do you think that mindset is what's enabled you to continue doing it as long as you have? Probably. Just yeah. by not stopping? Yeah. Well, the thing is this. I, I, I love the the engine work. I like the challenge of new challenges. I like the people I deal with. And, you know, and I have, when I get up in the morning to come here to do it, I'm not coming to go to work. I'm coming to have fun. And that's the difference. That's awesome. Yeah. But it finally gets to a point where enough is enough. And it's like that, where you don't have four or five threads sticking out. You know how you, you'll see some that the, that the nut goes on and there's a whole bunch of threads sticking out? Mm -hmm. To me, that that's not a sanitary way to do it. I like to have it where maybe, maybe you got one thread and you look, they're all like that. Did you uh, cut them and then turn the ends down? The studs are all special made. ARP makes all... They made every stud for this engine, and uh, they're purpose-built studs. Okay, first thing is we had to figure a way to monitor top dead center. And, and the reason I'm going through that with you is because there's no distributor here. It's a crank trigger ignition. So over here, this one is the crank sensor. Aluminum piece here, this is the body. It bolts onto the cover, and this is the pointer, and you see it's slotted so it's adjustable. Mm -hmm. So we'll get the engine on number one cylinder, and then we will adjust this so the pointer points right to dead zero. As you notice, it has a code wheel behind it. Mm -hmm. When we got this uh, dampener, we, ma we made our own crank hub that goes on the crankshaft that the dampener bolts to and the pulley bolts to. We had this code wheel made that has four lobes on it that are 90 degrees apart. Uh, we set the engine at 10 degrees before top dead center for the ignition. And when you have it all bolted up and you have this point at top dead center, over here you'll have a a lug, this will be right to the center of that of this crank sensor. Get to, I'll get something to show you. Because the re reluctor wheel has got magnets in it, and then there's a space, right? Yeah, the, 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 the code wheel is just a piece of steel. Okay. But the, 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 the sensor is the one that has the magnet in it. Okay, okay, the sensor has a magnet in it. Yeah. He doesn't even like sitting down. No. He's already going up to get stuff. Well, it's kind of cool to think back to the old original engine. Yeah, it had the distributor in it. So the all these little modifications you have to make in order to make it work. You go from having a distributor here. Ed, did the original engine, did the distributor run off off that intermediate shaft? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you see right here, that round piece? Mm-hmm. That's where the distributor went. Uh, and it it dropped just, in and ran it, yeah, off of you, that. But, but you see, with the manifolds and all this stuff, there's no way you'd, you you put yeah, it in there. No. Okay. Plus, this is probably way more precise too by yeah. being able to have that. This, this, is, this is dead mess because you can, with it like this, you can put a timing light on it, and you can have the engine idling at say 700 RPM. And if you're brave enough, you could hold it open to 8,000 RPM and it wouldn't move. It'd be just, just stays. Where with the distributor, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. When we go to do this, before we put the sense, the crank sensor in, we just have this piece bolted here. So the engine, we say we've turned the engine over to 10 degrees before top dead center, and then this. Oh, I see it, yeah. This will be sitting there. So then 
to make sure we get it dead in the center before we put the, the crank sensor in. This we push this in. Hmm. You see how it's, and that will go right to the tip of this of the tooth. And once you've got that set, then this thing's adjustable. So you loosen those bolts and it moves so that you get a dead nuts in center of the lug. And then, then you tighten the two bolts up, take this out, and then you screw this in. And then this, and this uh, clearance for that is like 30,000. So now you've got your crank business set so that the engine will run that's what fires this part. That's what fires it. Okay. So it knows where it is. It yeah. knows where it is all the time. Right. Just as consistent. Not, not, nothing. It can't change or nothing. Whether it's 1,000 RPM or 20,000 RPM, it's right there. Okay. Then the next thing is you have your computer box. And something has to tell the computer box when number one cylinder comes up. So that's what you have. Now, we, remember in the picture here, this, this gear here, this is this little piece bolts on it, but in this particular case, we've got fuel injection and we're using a, a Bosch pumps. We're not using a mechanical pump. So we take that deal off. Now we just have the gear. What we've done is we've made an aluminum piece that bolts onto that gear. I'll get it and show you. I have it. <laughs> This is some fancy mill spec stuff. Not normal. As you probably noticed from his other shop, the attention to detail on everything he does is second to none. I mean, look, everything is polished perfectly. <laughs> That's perfect. <yeah. laughs> now, this aluminum piece bolts onto that gear. Okay. Now, the aluminum piece is made. The three holes are bolted on because that's basically mm -hmm. what bolts that on. So it's not, we haven't changed anything there. Mm -hmm. This part isn't in yet. We have to figure out on this aluminum piece, this is a magnet, where we want to put that. So what we do is when we go to set this one, it, that's that sensor. It's, it's basically like that sensor, only it's just a smaller diameter sensor. And we set this one at about 40 degrees. And the reason for that is we want to have them far enough apart that they, so they, at speed, at high RPM, they don't read each other. They're far enough apart. We will turn the engine over 45 degrees before top dead center. This part, this, this piece we've already have made, and, and we, this sensor, we take it out. So now you just have a hole in there. But this is bolted in there. So then we go through with a center punch. Dimple. Dimple. And then we take this out, drill it and tap it, and put the crank sensor in hmm. of the cam sensor. So when this gets bolted up, when you get, have the engine at 45 degrees before top, top dead center, this hole is dead nuts in line with that. So and then, the reason for not doing them all at top dead center is so that they, they don't interfere with each other. Right. So we do the ignition 10 degrees before and we do this one, you could do it 30 degrees or 50 degrees, but we, we pick 45 degrees apart. This one's set at 45 degrees, this one's set at 10 degrees. The bolts that we got, ARP had to make them for us because we need non-magnetic bolts. Because when, yeah. this is, when this is going around, if you've got a regular bolt here, here, and here, it could pick up the, the, the signal and give us some goofy readings. So you got to make sure that the only magnetic part you got is that part. So anyway, they made us magnetic bolts, non-magnetic non bolts, washers and nuts for bolting this up. We can screw this in and this, this one will have about 30, 35 thousandths clearance between this and this. And the function of this one is this tells the engine when number one cylinder comes up. It's almost like a redundant. Uh, yeah, it's very precise. Yes. So it doesn't have to count through that to run the system. See, no. where with a distributor, you know, you got the slack and the rotor and 
in the gears and all that stuff. We've eliminated all that. Now it's just one on one. Hmm. And then this is oil pressure. This is coming from, we measure the oil going from the filter back to the engine. We, we're not concerned about the oil pressure going to the filter. We want to know what the engine's saying. Mm -hmm. So then they just take a line right off of there to, to their gauge. Okay, next thing, water pump. Ford made the FE water pump. Then they made some short water pumps for the camera. And they only made a handful of them, and they never made any more. So when we got this thing, we, if we used a FE water pump, it'd be out to here. Hmm. So what we did is uh, Elbrock makes water pump, but they make an FE. So we, and B and I have such a good relationship with Edelbrock, they gave me just the housings. And then we cut this part off, because the housing took that much to cut all that off. And we had a fixture made that you would bolt the water pump in to weld all this up so that everything runs dead true. And, and we had them made, they're exactly like the Cameron water pumps back in the 60s when they made them. Hmm. Do you know uh, Steve Watt? I do. Yeah, he's, yes. he's the one that did the fabrication. Not surprising, yeah, it looks like it was cast that way. Yeah, in fact, he's, he's, he built the water manifold. He built a lot of stuff for me over the years. Steve is like one of the main guys behind the Speed Steve, Demon. Yeah, he is. Yeah. So, Bonneville. Huh. Can you do that, Wilder? The one that goes 480 miles an hour. Yeah. In fact, Sylvia and I are going to the salt this year. Oh, and also, I, I know they're they're trying to go 500, and they yeah. think they, if the salt is good, they think they can. Yeah. It's not going to rain this year. Uh, okay. That's a flip of the coin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the injection system on this. Obviously, it was carbureted in that book, and yeah. that's not carbureted or supercharged. Yeah. No, it came carbureted. It came with two four barrels or a single four barrel. And uh, yeah, single four barrel. That must have been choked. <laughs> I yeah. think even breathed with that. But but that, it had one carburetor or two. Okay. And uh, on the fuel injection system, uh, the fellow that, that that did the fuel injection, his name is Graham Western. Uh, he originally was an IndyCar electronic engineer. He worked for Cosworth, and. Uh, Back in the day when uh, all the fuel systems were all mechanical for Indy, and then Cosworth came up with their first uh, electronic system, they sent Graham to the U.S. to be with the system and help people that were running the engine. And at the time, uh, Craco uh, was running an IndyCar team. They had Michael Andretti, and I think, uh, I don't remember who the other driver was. But anyway, uh, Graham came here and uh, he was in charge of the fuel injection system for it. And he liked California so well that he ended up quitting his job at Cosworth and he opened up an electronic shop here in California. Hmm. And that was in 1982, 83. And he and I became friends when he was with the IndyCar thing. And then when he went to uh, his own company, we became better friends. And we used his stuff exclusively, his, his, which is, this is one of them, which is, real, and I have, his, on my Roadster, I have his system. I thought so, I was about to ask you, this is the same setup on your Roadster, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. 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 And he, he's really knowledgeable and, uh, and he's been a lot of help to me. But anyway, uh, he built the, the system, and uh, the manifold is a Hillborn system mechanical. And Graham made uh, the fuel system for it, and it has a harness, mm -hmm. there's all the injector nozzles. This, this sensor measures fuel pressure, measures water temperature. Uh, this in here measures air temperature mm. going in because there's a hole in here yep. in the front. And then the sensor screws into it. I sent the manifolds to Kinsler, which I've done a lot of business with him over the years. And they're the ones that did all the machine work on the manifolds to fit the injectors. And we made a lot of changes to it. One of the things we did was uh, 
you notice each butterfly we can adjust. These are the adjusters. This one here adjusts this butterfly. This one adjusts this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, the same on the other side. So I can have the engine sitting here idling and we can adjust each butterfly so that we get the idle just perfect and we can measure the exhaust temperature and get them all within 10, 15 degrees. And look how this, sweet that looks. This is fuel in. Mm -hmm. It goes in here. And then this measures the, the pressure. And this is fuel out. Mm -hmm. and this is the this is the regulator, fuel pressure regulator. So fuel in, this line here goes back to the tank. That's the, 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 the engine doesn't see. Sensor here is is the idle. When you have the throttle closed and the engine's idling, the uh, angle of throttle is 10 degrees. If you had it any less than that, the engine wouldn't idle right, so. Okay, so that will tell you, okay, got it. the position of the. Yeah, so this here is a breather. And we've got it stuffed with chore, chore boy, which is a real heavy uh, washer, you know, for washing pots and pans. Huh. It's like steel wool. Yeah. It's, it's, they have water fitting in the back of the head and in front. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to do is make sure that we got enough water capacity going back and forth that the engine stays nice and cool. Then we put a cap here. And the reason for that is if the engine goes into a car, if the radiator is here, you don't fill this, you fill it with the radiator. But if you got it when the radiator is low, then, then you fill it with here. And the thermostat goes in here. There's a lot of area in the front before you ever get to the yeah, first yeah. combustion chamber. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but remember, this is on an angle. Yeah, spark plugs reaching in. Yeah. Ooh. Mitchell, you gotta come get a view of the, the ports over here. How nice those heads are done down there. That's some nice work. Oh, wow. You're looking at the entire exhaust valve. Just right there. Just right there. It just demonstrates the purpose of the this spatially inefficient, massive cylinder head. That, that's why. <laughs> that's why they do that. All that is is right here. This is this is the computer box that has all the information to run the engine. What did you think of the EFI when it came around? Oh, I loved it. See this plugged into that. It's like military type connections. All military connectors, yeah. The nice thing about military connectors, they don't come unplugged. Huh. They, you know, push, so, so many of them, they use a push-pull deal. You, you always take a chance of it not getting hooked up right or coming undone. The TSA really had a problem with this? They did, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. How long has that been your toolbox? Probably 19... Huh. So, when my dad was born, are you a lefty? You just use both hands. Um, I'm a lefty, but I use both hands. Well, let me set this down. Oh, I see it. Oh, yeah, she's gonna be a pain in the butt. Oh. Or you can just do that. <laughs> That's why he's that pink. And I'm not. <laughs> oh wait, now check this out. With that thing out of the way, you can actually see the springs. Wow. That's a blown fuel piston. Oh yeah, so that was a Dykes top ring. Right. Yeah. A little step in there. So the Dykes is like the original gas port. It's the gas pressure that gets behind the ring that actually forces it out to seal. It's not the tension of the ring itself that does it. It's gas pressure. So that idea of that Dykes top ring is that there's this you machine that step in there and it gives the, it more area because the rings aren't pushed in. They're out against the cylinder bore. That step gives it area for the gas pressure to get behind and push the ring out. Are you done here? I'll put this. Yes, sir. Yeah, so that dike style, you can see that little groove in there. 
Oh yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Did somebody reproduce those copper tubes or those? No, that's a foreign part. It looked old. Man, that is a nice looking intake port. But an engine like this, even though it may only make like 600 horsepower, I bet it makes a ton of torque though, right? Yeah. So it's probably, oh, and there's your injector location right there. It's a pretty big valve. Two and a half inch. Yeah. <laughs> Two and a half inches. I, was like, I thought that thing looked pretty big. You ever talk to your engines like they're people whenever nobody's around? Yeah, I do. I, I talk to them when people are around. <laughs> Back to Steve Lewis used to tell people, when you get an engine from Ned Pink, you don't own it. He just lets you run and race it, but it's his engine. <laughs> I know in 30, 50 years, I'll look back one day and think, man, I got to spend time with Ed Pink. And realizing that in the moment while we're doing this stuff is just so freaking cool because the perspective is the closest thing we will ever have to a time machine. And the present is the closest thing we'll ever have to a time machine. If you treat the present moment as if you are looking back on it from the future, what would you do differently? If I had the opportunity to go make a video with Ed Pink, but I'd have to fly all the way out there just to sit with him for a couple hours and fly all the way back. And I didn't take that opportunity. 30 years from now, I would love to go back to last week and take that opportunity. We want to bring you stuff that you want to see. Leave us a comment. If you got anything interesting that you know about, we get some really good leads from viewers a lot of times. We want to know that stuff. You can connect with me on Instagram. Uh, Stapleton 42, Facebook Stapleton 42, Twitter Stapleton 42. I think you get the picture. You can go to stapletonautoworks.com and support the channel by, you know, buying a hat or something. Or you could become a channel member, which uh, you'll just get access to posts of ahead of time what we're doing, pictures and information that we haven't made public yet. And uh, there's some perks that come with that with live streams too, where we like to talk to you guys and answer your questions. It's a little bit different around here. We, we really value everybody who watches these videos. And if you speak up often enough, we will get to know who you are. We want to, we take pride in getting to know those who take the time to get to know us. So thank you everybody and uh, speak up. Let us know who you are.